Good evening and welcome to the Gateway to Heaven uh, Home Bible Study Program. My name is Anthony Blades and this is Chris. And today we're going to be uh, studying uh, the third chapter of the Gospel of St. John. It's a very important chapter and it deals with uh, born again experience because Jesus said that you must be born again. Uh, we will also uh, look at uh, a discussion uh, John's testimony of Jesus and we'll see how the Pharisees try to create some problems for John but nevertheless uh, at the end of the program uh, uh, if you want to get a copy of, of today's uh, uh, message you can do so we'll let you know and there are also some other offers uh, some uh, newly published books we'll let you know how you can get a copy of those books as well so let's begin with a little prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we're here uh, to study your word and, and get to know you better, to fellowship with you. Lord, we thank you. We, we pray for all those who are listening, either by television or by the internet. We welcome you to be a part of it. God, we ask you to bless them, open their ears that they may hear what is being spoken today, their eyes, their spiritual eyes, that they may understand what God is saying in his word. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. Okay, so we begin reading uh, the third chapter of John, and it goes like this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Uh, let me stop right there for a second. Uh, he's a, Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. Now, he was a Pharisee, and we know what the Pharisees are all about. The Pharisees, they are under the law, uh, and, and Nicodemus would, was one of those. But the point that he came to Jesus by night is something very interesting. This, I would say that Nicodemus not only was a Pharisee, but he was what we call a secret disciple. Because as we go down in the latter chapters of John, even at the, the crucifixion and the death of Jesus, you will see where Nicodemus was present there. He, as a matter of fact, he asked uh, Pilate for the body of Jesus. And again, he was also rich because he, he brought there about a hundred pounds of spices. I mean, and that's a lot of money uh, to get that. So we know he was a Pharisee, he was rich, and again, he was a, a secret disciple for fear of the Jews. And, and this is important too because in the ninth chapter of the same uh, book of John, we see where we have um, a, a boy who was uh, healed. He was born blind and Jesus healed him. And, and the Pharisees, uh, they were upset about it because not so much because of the healing, but because it was done on the Sabbath day. And they had already passed a decree that anyone who would confess that Jesus was the Christ would be thrown out of the synagogue. And in, in that ninth chapter we notice where the Pharisees came and they asked the parents whether this was their son or not. And they said, yes, it's our son. And they asked them, um, how did he uh, uh, get his sight back? And they were scared. They did not want to confess Jesus. Uh, he was the Messiah. He did it. They said, ask him. He's of age. So it's the same with Nicodemus here. Uh, he came at night because he did not want to be thrown out of uh, the synagogue. Even though he's a ruler, they could throw him out as well if he had confessed Jesus as Lord. So we, we continue here. Uh, it says that, uh, he said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with you. Now, Chris, do you see anything here? Number one, he came at night. We talked about that. Uh, uh, why would anyone want to come to somebody at night? I mean, to discuss something spiritual. You know? Well, he could be afraid. That's number one. He was definitely afraid, as we, we discussed. And, I mean, he's a ruler of the Jews. I mean, he ought to know things. Why is he coming to ask Jesus these things? He could have um, 
since he's heard or seen what Jesus has done, maybe he wanted to hear for himself or see for himself what he could do for um, for Nicodemus. Well, uh, that's that could be one reason he wanted to. Perhaps he just wanted to see how how are these things do. He said, "Look." We know that you are a teacher come from God. So he's acknowledging, look, you know, you are not any ordinary kind of person. We know that you, you are good, you are righteous, you, you come from God. Anybody who comes from God is a righteous person because God is with them. So he, he recognized that. And then he, he must have thought that um, in his ministry, there's something that is not, you know, um, as righteous as he sees in Jesus. So he's coming to find out like, like, what is it about you that's so different to us Pharisees? Here's what Jesus said. He never asked this particular question, but look how, look how, he never asked a question. He's about to ask it, but because Jesus is omniscient, Jesus knows your very thoughts. He, Jesus went ahead, read his thoughts. He read the question in Nicodemus' head before he could ask it. Here's, here's what. Nicodemus just said, we know that thou art uh, a teacher come from God because no man can do uh, these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. He just said that. He didn't ask a question. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus answered. Now if you ask a question, you give an answer. So Jesus knew there was a question in there, and the question, Jesus is giving the answer to the question that was inside of Nicodemus' head, but he didn't know how to bring this question out. Jesus said, he answered, and he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, you know, if we look at Mark, in, in the book of Mark, I believe Mark chapter 10, a rich man came to Jesus and he asked the question that Nicodemus would have asked. He asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's the same kind of question. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be born again? And if you notice, there's something very uh, outstanding in this statement, in this question. They're all asking, what must I do? As though there is something that you can do to be born again. In fact, there is nothing that you can do to be born again. There's nothing you can do. So anyone who's asking, what must I do? What must I do? Even the disciples in John... Uh, I believe it's John chapter 7, the disciples say, what must we do to do the works of God? And again, Jesus would say, you, you, don't, you can't do nothing. All you have to do is believe on the one that God has sent. So in this dispensation of grace, the key thing that we have to do, and I'm just using the word do uh, very widely here, is you have to believe. If you believe, that's all you have to, to do, if I may use the word do. So, he says, you must be born again, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, when you hear the word born again, let's say you never read this. Because, no, this is the first time that the word born again was used. Born again. This, this is the first time that this was used right here, John chapter 3, verse 3, right, 3 and 5. Uh, what do you think of when you hear the word born again? Because a lot of people think that Nicodemus was, you know, he was acting kind of stupid, you know, he should have known what born again really is. He's a, he's a ruler of the Jews, a big teacher and all that, member of the Sanhedrin. I mean, you know, he's a big guy. So... He hears the word born again. He knows the word born because he was born. And he knows what it means again. So you have to be born again. So what do you think of when you hear the word born again? 
well, when it comes to mind, just what the, probably a normal person would think, born again would be to be born all over again. Exactly. That's, that's what it means to be born again. Okay, and that, that is exactly how Nicodemus uh, responded. Here's what he says. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? You, you tell me i got to be born again, I'm already old. you telling me, and he, he goes on to say, Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So, I mean, he really uh, opens up this, this thing so wide. Said, you know, like, I have to go back inside of my mother's womb, get small again right back down to, uh, you know, the sperm right back down, and then start all over and come out again. Like, he really, he, he really uh, <laughs> makes this a kind of a crazy um, saying. But here's what Jesus said. And, and this is uh, one of the most important uh, things in the entire Bible. Because this here um, is totally dependent on what Jesus has done. This statement here is the most important statement in the Bible to be born again because no one would be born again if Jesus hadn't come to this earth, if he hadn't died on the cross, if he hadn't been buried and raised again from the dead. No one would be able to be born again as Jesus is saying. And there's, there's reasons for that because in John 7.39, Jesus uh, was talking about uh, the spirit that people would receive if they hunger and thirst. And, but the Bible goes on to say in John 7.39 that he spoke of the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, that uh, they who believe on him would receive. But, but they couldn't get it yet because Jesus was not yet glorified meaning that Jesus had not yet gone to the cross and fulfilled uh, his duty to die for the sins of the world and then be raised from the dead. So this year, the whole Bible hinges on this statement. And this is what Jesus said. He said, verily, verily, and anytime you see that verily, verily, it, it, it means, look, truly, truly, our arms, this is a truth. You've got to hear it. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, some commentators have um, some other... Uh, uh, translations for this and they might well be correct now when they say when when Jesus said that you must be born of water there are there are two interpretations here one is when you as a natural person me and those who are watching by my internet uh, a natural person when they are born they are born of water that, that young child, that baby, is in the mother's womb encased in a sack of water, mm -hmm. right? And when that water bag breaks, then you know it's time for that baby to come out. So that's, some commentators say, well, yeah, so that's the water that, that Jesus could be referring to, that first, you have to be born of water. I mean, this is not for the dead. To be born again is not for the dead, it's for the living. So first, you've got to be born of water, and then when you're born of water, then you'll be born of the Spirit. So it's, in a way, two births taking place here. You must be born of water, you're born a natural person, and then after you're born uh, and you come to life, then you can receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and He will give you the Holy Spirit. So now this is the water and the Spirit. 
but there is another translation and I, I took a bit of notes on that um, in Titus uh, 3 5 it says let me see if I get a note uh, I have a note on that somewhere Titus 3 5 when they speak of, of uh, the water they, they're speaking of the Word of God because the Word of God is is like water that washes you okay for instance uh, Titus 3 chapter 3 verses 3 to 8 let me just go across there quickly Titus 3 3 to 8 Titus 3 I'm just gonna read this and you'll see where the water uh, can be the word there's some other scriptures and I'm gonna mention them in a while it says for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish disobedient deceived so serving our uh, divers lost and pleasures living in malice and envy hateful and hating one another no that's that's how we were but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior to what man appeared when that appeared here's what happened uh, 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 not by works of righteousness which we have done when the love of God appeared not by works of righteousness we can do good things but it's not by that not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost so that's how we get saved by washing by the washing you see that there by the washing the word washing water you use water to wash you see so when you use that word washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life this is a faithful saying he says so here's a washing of the word washing Another one that, that reflects uh, uh, that, that, that uh, water is the word. Here is another scripture that reflects it. If we go to Ephesians 5.25. Go there. I'll just go across there quickly. Ephesians 5.25. You're watching on the internet. You can, you can go to Ephesians. Ephesians 5.25. We'll see how... How uh, this washing and the word, how they go together, and and as a matter of fact, in this particular uh, chapter, um, Paul is is uh, talking about the husbands and the wives, and he, he draws that um, uh, reference there. Listen to what it says. I'll go to twenty five. He says, "Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church." And gave himself for it. He he brings a, he's talking about husbands, how husbands ought to, to treat their wives, and how you know wives have to be submissive to their husbands in the Lord and so on. So, but here's what he says in 26, Ephesians 5, 26. Here's what he says: that he might sanctify and cleanse it. He might sanctify, set it apart, and cleanse it. You hear that? With the washing of water by the word. You see that? So that's how he is going to sanctify the church. He's going to wash it. You see? Uh, and he's going to present it wholly unto himself. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish so what men ought to love their wives as their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself so there's there is that washing there's that word how that word washes that's and I I prefer to think of it uh, in this light um, but again the boat uh, seems quite uh, feasible Ephesians 5:35. Ephesians that was Ephesians 5:25. To 28 you can take note Ephesians 5 25 to 20 it'd be good for you to take these notes because you can always refer back to it uh, uh, whenever you want to study uh, 
uh, on the born again experience and this is a huge I mean this is so important you know and and it's so powerful uh, this this uh, this statement this chapter that uh, John is uh, uh, talking about here take the notes write the scriptures down you can go yourself in your quiet time and, and explore and meditate on it and you'll see what you get now another another one again where we're talking about this water if you go to first John 5 first John chapter 5 and we'll just look at verses uh, 6 to 8 let's go to first John 5 verses uh, 6 to 8 there, 1 John 5, verses 6 to 8. I want you to see this. Verses 6 to 8. Talking about life, that you only find this life in Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. 1 John chapter 5. Now we're talking about the born again experience. What it means to be born again. How, how does it happen? This is what Nicodemus wants to find out. How can a man be born again? What's this born again experience? You know. Does a man go back into his mother's womb and be born all over again? No, that's not what it is. Jesus is explaining here uh, what it means to be born again. And John did a, a fantastic uh, 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 translation here. He, he, he put it beautifully, uh, John, the beloved disciple. This is what he says. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bear it witness because the Spirit is truth. You see what he says? On the cross, when Jesus died, John 19, 30, it says, Jesus looked up to the Father and said, Father, it is finished. In John 19, 30, then he bowed his head and, and he died. He said, Father, into your hands I command my Spirit. Right? He knew that the job was done even before that. In John chapter 17, the night before uh, he was arrested, before he was crucified, uh, uh, he was praying to the Father. It's, it's one of the greatest prayer in, in the entire Bible. The whole chapter 17 is a prayer. Uh, there are different prayers. Prayers for himself, there's prayers for uh, the disciples, uh, that they may be one, that there will be unity with them. All of this is, is what has happened in John chapter 17. So, so here's what he says. This is the same water on the cross after he died, he was already dead. The soldier came and he plunged his, his spear up into Jesus' side. And out came water and blood. That's that water again. You know, Jesus had to die in order for us to be born again. Here's what it says. Verse 7, 1 John, chapter 5, verse 7.